Let me switch over to the housing issue, because this McLean's article, I, I was sent a number of copies about this while it was away about, uh, you know, is this going to be a real issue for Vancouver? And I think there are decent arguments on both sides of what we see here. And Rob certainly uh, talked about some of the issues on the Canadian housing side. But there are arguments that support that uh, it may be more like a balloon than a bubble. So this is a special report that was put out in December of 2011 by Bank of Montreal, uh, primarily by Sherry Cooper. And I'm going to give you some data and, and information about it. So the first thing is, over the last um, 10 years, Canadian housing prices have risen basically 100%. That's less than Australia, Hong Kong, Sweden, New Zealand, and South Africa. And it's more than a number of European countries, Germany, Japan, US, Italy, France, and Switzerland, Japan being the exception. And it's pretty well the same as China. So yes, we've had an increase in housing prices, more than some, less than others. Although to be fair, in Vancouver, our prices have gone up 160% in that same 10 years. Now, one of the things that has been a big issue in the paper is we Canadians owe too much money personally. Rob talked about that, and that our debt to GDP, or sorry, our uh, debt um, to income, personal income ratio, has now surpassed that of the US. This measure is done in after-tax dollars, and she makes a strong argument, which I think is a good one. You should be using pre-tax dollars, because for better or for worse, we more or less fund our health care system through our tax system, and the social security costs and premiums that they pay are far higher than what we pay in CPP. So if we compare pre-tax incomes, in fact, we're well below the US in terms of our liabilities. The problem is obviously both of them are increasing. Our debt um, service ratio is not cheap, but it's not expensive either. It was much higher in 1990 and 2007. So again, it's not what I would call alarming. And our vacancy rates, and this is the issue of there being potentially a glut of condos in Vancouver and Toronto, both markets are still in the 1% range for vacancies. So that would not suggest that we're dealing with anything that looks like a glut. We wrote about this. If you want to get more data on this issue, there's a newsletter that we put on our website earlier this year, or earlier last year, I should say. There's another issue that could be a, what I call a plus for where, for instance, specifically Vancouver housing will go. There was a, a recent article uh, talking about what we will call the Chinese diaspora. And they did a survey of Chinese families that have more than a million dollars of investable assets. And we're talking approximately one million families uh, would fit into this category. And 46% of them said they were looking to leave China and emigrate to some other part of the world for a, a number of reasons. Maybe it was investment issues, it might have been taxation issues, it can be safety issues, it can be education issues for their children, any number of reasons. But anyway, 46% or several hundred thousand want to emigrate. And of those, 37% want to emigrate to Canada, and most of them would come into uh, Vancouver or Toronto. If this happens, it would be a major floor under real estate, if, if there's anything like that level of uh, money and people coming in. There's also, of course, all of these other articles. The one I like the most is this one at the bottom. If you can read it, it's what I would call House Ageddon. There's a website that you can go to that has a clock on it. As you can see, the clock says there's 1,509 days, 10 uh, hours, 42 minutes, and 22 seconds exactly until the housing bubble ends in Vancouver. So if you're trying to time the purchase of a house, uh, you now have a specific date to shoot for. And we'll include that in your plan and we'll work with you to try to make sure that the timing is as good as possible. Uh, I'll mind you, as Rob pointed out, that the problem is that since the world is ending in December 21st, 2012, none of this matters anyway. Um, Rob talked about the fact that Canadian housing is incredibly expensive, and Vancouver specifically is considered the second most uh, unaffordable major city in the world. So I, I wanted to get some data about that. First off, we do have some issues because obviously offshore buying makes a difference to our market. And while I did talk about the wealthy Chinese coming into North America, there is a housing bubble and a correction going on in China as we speak. 
And uh, in new condo construction in different cities, we've seen pr housing correction, prices correction, correcting as much as 30% in the last uh, six months. So that would be a concern to me in terms of how much capital could then come here if that capital is having financial difficulty at home. This is data that you can get from uh, the, um, what used to be called the MLS website, and it shows the listings for Vancouver up to the end of January. So I've looked at Vancouver West Side, Apartments Detached, Richmond, and Vancouver East. All you can tell from this is that while the listings are higher than they were a year ago, they're lower than they were four or five months ago. So again, we have more inventory. Again, it's hardly excessive inventory. This is a longer term graph. This is the price of housing in Vancouver has gone up 7.5% roughly over the last 40 years. And if you add in rental income, so you can look at it in comparison to say stocks, roughly speaking the return on a house in Vancouver, or a con not a condo, a house, would be about 9.5% a year, adding back the rental income. And the condo prices have gone up about half as much, so they're not nearly as uh, uh, elevated status as detached housing is. And if you were invested in the stock market, you would have actually earned a higher rate of return in the Toronto stock market, including rental income, than you would have by buying Vancouver housing for the last 40 years. So in other words, that doesn't tell me that this particular asset is being excessively priced when we look at this particular data. But there is a reversion to the mean issue. Um, one of the uh, young fellows that um, uh, we know was able to find me really old data from back in the 60s. This is, some of you might be old enough to remember prices like this. Um, the average sale price in 1960 was $13,105. Wouldn't you love to buy a house like that today? Right? And it went to $31,000 by 1972. That was a 7% increase. Pretty well what happened between 1977 and 2002. But in the last decade, prices have gone up almost 11% a year. So this is the part that makes me the most nervous. They're about 3% a year above trend for the last decade. And that to me is something that I don't think is remotely sustainable. In the last six months, prices in Vancouver have actually gone down 1 to 2%. And I'd be surprised if that trend doesn't continue. So our view is basically that prices are over the long-term rates. Mortgage rates eventually will have to go up, although I agree it might take longer than we expect. There are any other number of economic shocks that could have a material impact on what happens in housing here that may occur. Um, if we're lucky, prices will stay flat for maybe you know, a few years and incomes will sort of catch up to where the prices are. And if we're not lucky, we're likely to see a 10 or 15 percent decline in prices. It's happened at least on three separate occasions in the last 40 years where house prices in Vancouver have dropped 15 percent. Typically, that price decline has lasted three years, and it's taken another three years before you recover to where it was before. So it's been like a typically a six-year dip in total. So let's just talk br uh, briefly about asset allocation. In case you weren't aware of this, the commercial real estate markets are equal to the um, equity markets in the developed world. But most people only have, have a multiple invested in equities when they compare it to their investments in commercial or investment grade real estate. We have, as you know, a partnership that we have um, invested real estate in for many years with clients and we converted it to a single partnership in 2005. So last year it had uh, 277 million of assets and about 146 million of capital. Um, we try to keep the leverage pretty low. It's below 50% currently. The return last year was 12.5%, uh, and it's been about 9.8% a year since 2005. And our focus is industrial, retail, and commercial. We haven't really found our numbers being able to work in multifamily residential. On the U.S. side, it's a smaller investment pool. We started investing just a few years ago. Um, the return last year was 11 it is invested in multifamily residential for reasons I'll come to in a second, and commercial in the Pacific Northwest, specifically in Seattle. So the key factors for us in developing this pool is number one, all of the directors of Spire are actively invested in the pool themselves, in collectively about $10 million. Um, we, our basic premise in buying real estate is to buy an asset that, whose current income is at least 2% higher than what it's going to cost us to borrow money. Uh, locations uh, we, with strong demographics, that makes sense. Um, if we can't see a 10-year rate of return 
of 10% or better net of fees, then we won't make an offer to buy the asset. And we have been in situations where we haven't been able to buy anything for as long as 18 months. So we're willing to be ve very patient, and as a result of sometimes not being able to buy things, Spire is often closed. I can say it will reopen at the end of March uh, and at the end of April for the U.S. pool. And basically, we try to keep it open as long as we can, but only when we can find new assets. So to give you some idea on the Canadian side, recently we've been able to buy single tenant assets where the income is more than 3% higher than the cost of financing. Right now we're borrowing money at 3.5% uh, uh, for five-year mortgages and maybe 4% for 10-year mortgages, and we're able to get 7%, uh, in some cases a little higher, in the form of income on the building. Um, from the American side, um, Rob talked about you know, the impact of the housing debacle. One of the things that came out a little over a year ago, uh, just bef after we started investing in multifamily residential, was this. This is a chart from Barron's Magazine. And this line here, this is what happened for their American housing bubble. It was going along, 60 to 65% of Americans owned a home, which means 35% rented. And then all of a sudden, as a result of cheap mortgages, no money down, you could say whatever you wanted to about your income and you could get any house you wanted. Um, people, home ownership rose at rapid rates and obviously as a result of the crash in housing prices, it's dropping and it keeps dropping and it's likely to go back to where it started. Every time it drops by 1%, 1.2 million people are moving out of a house and renting an apartment or renting a house. So from our perspective, it made more sense for us to invest in multifamily residential in rental properties in the U.S. because rental income is rising. So on the commercial side, the situation's a little bit different. There was a bubble, but not as much as the housing bubble in the U.S. The big advantage from our perspective was in 2000, the Canadian dollar was at 67 cents, and now you know, it's, just, it's above par, so it's higher than this 97 cents here. That means that when we look at a commercial asset in the U.S., we're paying 28% less than we would have paid for that asset 12 years ago. That doesn't happen to assets we're looking at in Canada. So the kinds of assets, so I'll just tell you a little story. We, we bought a commercial, uh, three commercial buildings in Seattle just recently, and this is what happened in the U.S. market to explain why we think there may be more opportunities there going forward than there are in the Canadian side. So we bought three buildings that four years ago, five years ago, I guess now, 2007, were sold for $37 million. Um, the buildings went into receivership, but they had a mortgage on them with GE Capital of $28 million. So we made, when they went into receivership at the beginning of last year, we competed with other companies and we made a bid and we thought we had the successful bid and then they, everything got pulled out from under us. And then it we were brought back to the table late in the year, and they were located in Pioneer Square, and they agreed to a purchase price from us of $19 million. So we then got a mortgage. Uh, we, the income rate on that, uh, those assets is 7% roughly, and we have a mortgage uh, with the Bank of America on this asset for half the value, which is fine with us, at 3%. So that kind of opportunity obviously doesn't present itself in very many, if any, Canadian markets that we're aware of. And so that's a unique offering in the US. And from the multifamily perspective, as long as we can buy um, income producing properties, because multifamily is arguably the lowest risk form of income producing real estate, we're gonna continue to try to acquire them as long as the market is as attractive as it is.